A very good morning, good morning. and welcome to the master class uh, lecture series. Today we have very dis distinguished speakers, both from NASA, professional astronomers. Uh, currently they are at Goddard uh, Space Flight Center, US. And to me, this is very special. Both of them happen to be my PhD supervisors. Uh, and so coming all the way from, you know, US giving a lecture in my hometown and taking them to my house. This is nothing short of Swadesh. <laughs> and it turns out, you know, Shahrukh Khan, it turns out that what she tells me, Dr. Sangeeta Malhotra, is that Shahrukh Khan happens to be her batchmate during undergrad. So she could have replaced Shahrukh Khan in Swadesh. Uh, so just to give you uh, their background, uh, Dr. Sangeeta Malhotra and Dr. James Rose currently are astronomers at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, US. Uh, she did her undergrad uh, in Delhi University, then master's at IIT Kanpur, and continued her PhD at Princeton. To uh, some of you who do not know Princeton's history, Princeton has produced, at least there are about more than 70 Nobel laureates affiliated to Princeton University, and where Albert Einstein was on the faculty list. So that is where both of them are coming from. Uh, Dr. Malhotra had various fellowships and positions, including Hubble uh, Fellowship, which is a postdoctoral fellowship, one of the prestigious uh, astronomy fellowships in the world. She was astronomer at Space Science Telescope, uh, that is in uh, Baltimore, US. She was a, a professor at School of uh, Space Exploration at Arizona State University. That is where she supervised me. So some of the, some of the qualities that I, I have today, they might have come from them. She has expertise in studying uh, galaxy, how galaxies evolved uh, over uh, right from the beginning. And she has led various projects currently at NASA and prior to that as well, which have led to uh, new discoveries. Dr. James Rhodes uh, is uh, also astronomer at NASA Gordon. Uh, he did his undergrad at Harvard, uh, then Harvard and Cambridge. Then he did his PhD at Princeton. Uh, he was a fellow at uh, National Optical Astronomy Observatory. That's where he did one of his fellowship, then at Space Telescope Science Institute. He was also a professor at Arizona State University prior coming to the uh, NASA uh, Gordon. 
both Dr. Malhotra and Dr. Rhodes are leading some of uh, the few missions, space missions uh, that are ongoing at NASA. Currently, Dr. Uh, Rhodes is a project scientist for UltraSat. So this is a space mission, which is a near ultraviolet imaging system. Uh, so both of, uh, both of them have a major contribution in astronomy and both of them have served as project leaders in several uh, NASA funded projects, uh, including facilities like uh, Hubble Space Telescopes and some of the biggest telescopes in the world. Uh, I would request uh, uh, Lulekar, Director of Higher Education, to please welcome them, both of them. And what we would do is, uh, Dr. Malhotra will give uh, her presentation first and followed by Dr. Rhodes' presentation. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions if you have, either during the talk or maybe after the talk. So you will be, you are welcome to ask any of those queries if you have. I would request Mondana to please. Please join me in welcoming both of them. explode 
for you to get your hair pin or nail. Don't take that too. I mean, this is true, but don't collect every nail you find on the street. <laughs> After I learned this, for some time I was doing that, and then I had to stop. Which also means, that, you know, the carbon in your body, the calcium in your bones, you can find out which sort of stars those things, elements were made from in. That's fascinating. So let me just start with some terminology. What is a galaxy? You know, you'll, you'll hear me saying galaxy all, uh, all through this talk. So let me just say, what is a galaxy? A galaxy is like an island in space. It's an island made of stars. And they're all held together. It's not just stars. Let me, let me start with stars. Held together by gravity and orbiting each other. So that's the simplest explanation. The other things, now let, let me go more complicated on you. Our galaxy is also a Milky Way galaxy. If you go out on a clear, clear night in dark skies, you see a band of Milky Way. Okay, stars stretching out. Our Milky Way galaxy has, has 100 billion stars. But that's only about 10% of the total mass it has. The other 90%, we don't know what is made of dark matter. We don't know what it is. We're still trying to find out. Okay. There's also gas. Um, stars form from gas. They live for a while. They may produce light. They produce heavier elements like calcium, carbon, oxygen, chlorine, all of those. And then they die and they give off gas to the rest of the system. So the great thing galaxies do is that they provide a stable place in an expanding universe where all of that gas comes back and then you have dust and, um, and, and planets can form and we can be on those planets. So that's the basic unit of cosmos is a galaxy. That's my personal opinion. I maybe biased because I study galaxies. So uh, this is a nearby galaxy, Andromeda. Um, and this too, you can see on a very dark night. Um, if anybody wants pointers on how to see this, with, with your eyes, don't need a telescope. I'll, I'll give you pointers afterwards. So. Okay, so what are we talking about in cosmology? Here we have a galaxy and Hubble. People have heard of Hubble. What Hubble did was early in 20th century, <coughs> He put together data taken by other people, I won't go into details, but it's called Hubble Law. And he found that the farther away our galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us. So far away galaxies are moving faster, the nearby galaxies are moving less fast, and you know, that's a plot. On one axis, on the x-axis is how far a galaxy is, and on the y-axis, how far it's moving away from us. And it's like, what's happening, you know? Our galaxy is not full of stale fish that are escaping, so all the galaxies are running away from us. Maybe some planets are. But what is happening? So it turns out, we concluded, that it's not that the galaxies are running away from us, or that we are in a special place at the center of the universe where people are moving away. It's just that the whole universe, space itself, is expanding. And the way I like to explain that is through an analogy. So if you have a rubber sheet and you put uh, little coins on them, right? And then you expand the rubber sheet. The coins stay in the same place. They're not moving. But they seem to move because the space below them, that's the rubber sheet, that's expanding. So that's what we are seeing. And then that's the two-dimensional version. And then you can look at the three-dimensional, or you can imagine the three-dimensional version. Space itself is expanding, and you have galaxies embedded in that space, and the galaxies stay put. They're not expanding. They're just chilling. They're like Friday night each time, you know, just chilling. <laughs> All right, so then, that, that's a profound discovery. And uh, it's an answer to one of the questions, I mean, uh, Dr. Tilbury mentioned Einstein. One of the questions that Einstein could solve when he did the, uh, this is 
like there's no solution to Einstein's equation where the universe is static. But there is a solution where the universe is expanding. So that's a solution to the general relativity, and it's a uh, viable solution. So um, I won't have time to go more into that, but uh, okay. So now, if you take all of these things that is, you see the universe is expanding, galaxies seem to be moving away from us, they're not moving away from us, they seem to be moving away. And now you run that movie backwards, like, I don't know, I'm old enough, we used to have VCRs and VHS, and we take some of these mo uh, wedding movies and then we run them backwards, and then you see people coming and taking out. <laughs> Mala from each other. It's very funny. I thought it was very funny when I it, but never mind. So when you run the big, uh, the sort of expansion movie backwards, it looks like everything was nearby each other. They were close together. All of these things. And if you run it extremely backwards, it means the galaxies were together, and you know the particles were colliding with each other, and everything was hot, very dense, very hot. 13.7 billion years ago, we think. And now we know when something is hot, it gives up light, it glows. You heat up bulbs, it glows, you make fire, it glows. It's not perfect analogy. The universe is no exception. So if it was hot, you should see the heat from this. And that was seen, discovered in the 60s by Penzias and Wilson, who got the Nobel Prize for that. That's uh, with this Han antenna, right after the Second World War, they were making, they were trying to develop technology for microwave radiation and all that. And they, they got this exquisite antenna. And wherever they pointed, there was this noise that didn't seem to go away. And there was a minimum noise that didn't seem to go away, and they couldn't explain it. And they even went in there and shooed the pigeons away and scraped all the white stuff the pigeons leave behind. <laughs> They thought maybe that was producing contamination in their signal, but no. And then they went and talked to some theorists who were working on, uh, uh, at, at Princeton University, who were working on um, the theories of the hard Big Bang, and, and were trying to get it experimentally. And when theorists and experimentalists talk, there's, there's good, good things come out. And um, so, that led to a Nobel Prize. It's a it's a, a World Heritage site. If you ever go to New Jersey, try to find it. This is a picture of my kids in front of it. So, um, uh, so okay. So there was the cosmic microwave background. I'm telling weird stories. I should stick to the point. There was the cosmic microwave background, which is the leftover glow of the Big Bang. And the problem then is that cosmic microwave background, you'll have seen pictures of that, and those are sort of magnified. It's very uniform. It's more uniform than the bluest sky. If you think of waves on the ocean in the Earth, the kind of fluctuations you see in the microwave background, they're like one centimeter wave on Earth-wide ocean. So it's very, very small fluctuations. And those fluctuations grew through gravity to make galaxies, to make stars, to make dust, to make elements, to make sheep and people and trees and coconuts and all of the good stuff. So the main idea, a lot of us are working on how did we go from that sort of very nice uniformity, how did galaxies grow, how did light come to be, how did stars form? So I'm very interested in it. It's a complex problem with lots of approaches and I'll just be able to talk about something. So what did we get? How did we get from here to there? What is the origin story of the universe? Now, like in Hindi movies, you have a little bit of a teaser and then uh, credits. Uh, I'll just say, I'm Sangeeta Mahocha. I work at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, this picture was taken at Goddard Space Flight Center. This is from Sodesi. Uh, there are many places I feel at home. Um, 
I did uh, my studies at Kanpur at Delhi University. I was an amateur astronomer while I was at Delhi University. Nehru planetarium feels like home. All the stuff like home. So it's all good. Um, so let's talk about space house. NASA has been launching astronomy called Space Telescope for a while. It took previous generations from mine to sort of work towards it and convince people. And Nancy Grace Roman was one of those people who worked on convincing that Hubble should be launched. She, she's called the mother of Hubble Space Telescope. And now Hubble has been taking astronomy data for more than half of the space age from when Sputnik was launched to here. So astronomy is a big part of space age and it inspires people and it's, it has an important place in society. Bias view, I think so. So there's Hubble, there's Chandra. Chandra is an X-ray space telescope. You can't see x-rays from the ground, the cosmic x-rays, because the atmosphere is in the way. And Chandra was named after Chandrasekhar, who's a Nobel Prize winner of, of Indian origin in the University of Chicago. And then there's Spitzer, um, also in infrared radio. So let me start going quickly, otherwise I'm gonna get there. So I, I, today I'd like to talk about JWST, which is the latest thing. So I hope you've all seen JWST as well in this case. I'll show some of them, but not all of them. I won't be able to. But you know, please go and see if I see. So this is the thing. Uh, if you look at light, our eyes, our eyes see very little part of light. This is in the wavelength space. There's radio is the longest wavelength, and then there's infrared. And then there's visi uh, visible light that we are able to see. Then there's ultraviolet and X-rays and gamma rays and it keeps going. So our eyes are, are able to see only very small part of the light there is. I mean, there are some birds who can see ultraviolet light, we can't see. But our brains are powerful enough to make detectors that can detect the other light. Thank you for that. <laughs> so, Remember I talked about how galaxies seem to be moving away because space is stretching? Now, as space stretches, the light that just left this galaxy and is coming towards us, that also stretches. So light is a wave, and as it stretches, it goes to longer and longer wavelengths. So if we want to see really distant universe, we need to go to redder and redder light. And finally, we have to go to infrared. Uh, I was in much, uh, I led one of the projects on the Hubble Ultra Deep Field in 2004-2005. We did spectroscopy of how deep, actually getting distances for some uh, of the uh, high redshift or most distant galaxies. And that's where uh, the finding the most distant galaxies bug got me. So I was working for Hubble Space Telescope then. And we were doing near infrared imaging. So, okay, let me come back and recap all of this. So in this diagram that shows the evolution of the universe, there was a big bang, there was an inflationary phase, which I won't talk about. And then you see the microwave background uh, at some stage, 400,000 years after the big bang. <coughs> And then there's the dark ages because the, the atoms have gone neutral. Hydrogen atoms and helium atoms, they're neutral. They have not yet formed stars. The uh, gas collapsing to form galaxies and eventually there'll be star formation and the first galaxies will form. And that happens between 0.1 billion and 1 billion years ago. And JWST was built to see that era, uh, and that's why it's in infrared. And that that era is also where we have been doing science. Uh, Professor Tilby has been work, was working with us some years ago for a long time. He's done some great work. I'll talk about some of that. 
and now JWST will just revolutionize everything. So, um, so JWST was built to capture faint in the red light. So this is how it goes. You know, if you go look at some monkeys, uh, these are male cats, these are not monkeys. And crocodiles. So warm-blooded animals, cold-blooded animals. Freshwater crocodile is cold-blooded, it's just come out of water. If you look in the infrared, the warm animals show brighter and the crocodile is poor thing, is cold, is doesn't show so well. So some of it is heat and uh, some of it is, so it's near infrared. Uh, uh, so Hubble Space Telescope went from UV, visible to here. And JWST, James Webb Space Telescope, will go much further. Spitzer went from here to here, so there's some overlap. Spitzer went to even longer wavelengths, but that was only a one meter telescope. Still, it did great stuff. JWST is six and a half meters, so. Um, so going to near infrared, it can peer through and examine dust. So this is a sli the slide that's what, a couple of months old. It should say, what is JWST doing instead of what will JWST mm -hmm. do? That's already changed. Um, solar system planets, find planets around other stars, that's expected. Uh, find molecules around other star forming regions, uh, black holes, uh, find regions where stars are forming, where stars form, they're, they're given, they, they're born, they live and they die. And closer to my heart, go to the really, really distant galaxies, see how the whole sequence of how stars begin forming, how they heat gas, how they assemble into galaxies, how galaxies become massive, and the light from the galaxies will clear the fog and uh, what we call reionization. So discovering some of the first galaxies. Now you'll hear a lot of JWST stuff about finding some of the first galaxy, and it's very exciting, they've been they're going to revolutionize the field, but you know, we've been doing it for a while too from the ground. Not, not so efficiently with as JWST because JWST is specifically trained for that, but we have been preparing for that. You know, in the 25 years I've been an astronomer and JWST has been coming up. I couldn't just sit and wait for JWST to come. So we've been using all the instruments we can use. So earliest known ionized bubble, this is from two years ago, Times of India Goa, Professor Tilbury's uh, led that study. It was ready. Um, since then, we've done other stuff uh, published in Nature Astronomy. Each of these dots is a galaxy. Each of these blue dots is a galaxy. The red dots are, are really bright galaxies. And those shaded areas are the bubbles they're blowing. And, uh, this is what it, you know, if you uh, see what bubbles they're capable of blowing, uh, ionizing the gas, which is basically, you have hydrogen gas between galaxies and you're ionizing it, make hydrogen get rid of its electron. And uh, that's, that's what these galaxies are doing. And that's what we call reionization. So the, here are the bubbles that come up. So expect it to be that size and they're overlapping. So that's the sort of thing we can just wait, uh, no, I shouldn't say waiting to study with JWST because we've been doing studies to find these galaxies, even with ground-based instruments, even, you know, even though they're not as sensitive as uh, JWST. The other thing we've been doing is finding local versions of primordial galaxies. So, you know, uh, we, while we are looking for galaxies at Rectus 7.7, which is less than a billion years after the Big Bang, we still them and saying, okay, these are the properties. Are there any nearby galaxies that have those properties? And we are finding local analogs. And this was uh, uh, started as a citizen scientist project. People looked at the Sloan Sky Survey and said, hey, these are Greenpeace galaxies. And 
They made up fun, they had a lot of fun with it. They made funny names, uh, Greenpeace, Galaxies, Peace Corps volunteers, etc. But uh, but we we our group and uh, other groups have been studying them very uh, in much detail, and we find that they are like the high uh, the the galaxies from the first billion years that we've been finding. But having a local version means that we can study them in so much more detail. <laughs> so uh, we've been doing that, and then. And then in June, was it June? Uh, the first deep field from JWST dropped. And this is a deep field. And the funny thing that happened was there was going to be a press conference on one day, and then uh, people heard that you know, White House wants to be involved in this. And uh, President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, they were part of the unveil. They, were, they did the first unveiling of this image. And this image is taken by the most powerful telescope we have at the moment, JWST. It can peer deep, deep into space, see some of the first galaxies. But it is also aided by a massive galaxy cluster, which is in the front. So let me see if this will work. So this is the massive galaxy cluster, which is acting like a gravitational lens, a natural lens that bends and amplifies light from galaxies behind it. I mean, this is again, you know, uh, Einstein's theory of gravity and all of that. So um, these long arcs that you see, they're basically distorted and amplified images from behind this massive cluster of galaxies. So these arcs, these arcs, they're beautiful. This one, uh, this one looks like a nun um, or a pizza, your preference. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of show you one example of science that came out of this. Now, JWST is not just for imaging, it also does spectroscopy, which is split up the light into different uh, color components and uh, tell us what the nature of those lights is. So, when we do spectroscopy, we see these lines, and these lines are like a fingerprint, or you know those bar uh, barcodes that you just scan. This is like a barcode, multicolored barcode of elements. So these three lines, uh, for example, these three lines are oxygen. These two are doubly ionized oxygen. This is hydrogen. So these three lines are distinct. I would recognize them in my sleep, in my dreams. But this is what the stuff dreams are made of. So these top things are the local analogs we had found while we were waiting for JWST to come out. And the bottom three are the spectra that JWST took, the same barcode. You see, they're, they're so similar. And from that, we can say how much uh, of the heavy element processing has been going on. So one of these galaxies has as few as 2% of the heavy element oxygen that our solar system has. So it's not very well developed, it's pristine, but it's not completely zero oxygen also, which is what you would see at the beginning of things. So this is just the beginning. We expect a lot more um, and now I'll summarize and uh, give way to uh, Professor Rhodes, who is here. So JWST is exceeding expe uh, expectations for finding galaxies at the dawn of light. We expect a lot more results. I mean, at some point, I won't be able to keep up. And, you know, it would be full-time job just keeping up with all the beautiful results that are coming out. A lot of the data, JWST data, is public. So uh, if you want to go play with the data, um, you can do that. It, NASA is going towards uh, open science. So after a while, the data becomes public. That has been the Hubble thing for always. After one year, all data become public. So a lot of, if you think of some science questions that you can answer with that data, 
that you can just get data from the archives. And this has been done making all the data available is to maximize the productivity that science from this data. So we expect great, great results. If somebody, if any of you feel like going and playing with that data, go ahead, do that, have fun, stay tuned. And we're also building a wide field mission. So JWST is like looking at the sky like this. And what we want to do is do big chunks of sky. And that will be talked by my colleague, Professor Jenkins. Thank you all for listening so attentively. Yeah. Regarding to early galaxies, how can we show that the due to stretching of space they have landed up in infrared zone and not microwave or radio wave? Oh, that would be very early if it went to microwave. And uh, there are physics reasons why we don't expect it. So um, let me see if I can go back and find this right. So 300,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, at that point, what happened was electrons and protons combined to form hydrogen. And at that point, the microwave photons were free to travel to us. They were not being scattered in that whole soup. So before that, uh, they, they couldn't have uh, fused. Uh, they couldn't have collapsed to form uh, ordinary matter contents. So what we are looking for is how much farther can we go in this space between 300, uh, 400,000 years and uh, 1 billion years after the Big Bang. So where is this uh, and how does it happen? And because it's a nonlinear problem, there's fluid dynamics, there's magnetic fields, there's radiation. <laughs> It's not a, you know, you can't do it by calculation. People are doing simulations. And I hope you'll get good answers. And all of those simulations have, I mean, we have to verify theory by observations, and that's what we have to do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that answers my question. So, was there any attempt made at finding galaxies in microwave? Like, till we have found the world's first, universe's first galaxy, the furthest galaxy in, my, in the infrared band. Was there attempts made to find something in microwave? So some of these known galaxies that we know at, you know, 0.7 billion years after this, they also emit in the microwave. We know that they do. And ALMA is a multinational collaboration that's looking at them in those wavelengths. So that, that's true. Okay, that's a true. millimeter wave. But um, the, the specific <laughs> thing is to get the rest frame UV, which is where the stars are the strongest, which has stretched to near infrared. That's right now, that's one of the most sensitive techniques for blind surveys. Okay, yeah, I have one more question. Yes. So we look at cosmic microwave diagonal radiation. So that's coming to other microwave. What is it originally? It is also UV? Ah. <laughs> So uh, we, we see it at uh, 2.7 Kelvin black body. Yes, true. What is it when? It's optical when it's emitted. Oh, it's optical. Okay. Okay, thank you. That answers that question. I have a question. Yes. You are sitting on a galaxy. Have you got any evidence that life exists also in these galaxies? Have we got any evidence that life exists in these galaxies? I hope it does. So one of uh, so uh, okay, I've been giving you a very biased view of JWST. One of the main things people want to do is look for not in other galaxies, but look for uh, we know there are about I don't know how many are there five thousand planets around other stars that we know about. There are of course more. So go look at the atmospheric spectroscopy of those planets and see whether those ratios of molecules and, uh, and atoms, whether that could happen naturally or whether it, it, it wants, you know, the sort of biosignatures that they call it. Because we know that 
when life uh, started on Earth, it changed the atmosphere of the Earth. So there, there's a huge number of it's 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 a beautiful emerging new field that I don't work in unfortunately, but I admire it. Looking for biosignatures in planets around other stars. And it won't be little green men walking, you know. They'll start with signatures of algae or you know that sort of thing. But it'll be a star. And I hope I get to see those results in my lifetime. Because this question cropped up because you shown in one of the slides. There are some oxygen, 2% of oxygen in, as you said. Oh, in that galaxy, yeah. the 2% of oxygen that we have in the solar system. Yeah, so getting planets made in those conditions, that's an interesting question, just to form the planets let alone life. But yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Thank you. Yes. Um, I don't know how pertinent this is, but uh, well, um, so uh, since we're looking at uh, the light and all of that, uh, can we also find direction? And one more thing is that as human beings, we always think at the center of the universe. And uh, can it, are we any closer finding that center of the universe through this? Is it possible? <sighs> The universe may not have a center, okay, right? So let's just think. Um, the farthest we can see is the age of the universe times the speed of light, okay? Because no information travels faster than the speed of light. So we can only see 13.7 light years away. Now we look in this direction and this direction, and we see similar things. I mean, you said galaxies are static and the space is expanding. Then how do they collide? Ah, okay, static in that sense, yes. So, so what is, so to do this properly, I need to, uh, the, the GR equation, right? But I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to wave my hands. Okay. So let's say there's expand, the expansion keeps going, and but it can be stopped, and space can come back and be stat somewhat static in local regions where there's enough mass. Pulsating? No, just like this. Okay. Different speeds. No, 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 we, we can have stable space. Like the the sun earth distance is, yeah. is, is not expanding like the expansion of the universe because there's enough gravity, enough matter locally to keep it static. Okay. So the Milky Way is not expanding like the expansion of the universe. So in that sense, that analogy of coins and a rubber sheet, no. Okay, but on top of that, expansion that we see of space, there are also a little jiggling that we see in galaxies, okay? So you see the Hubble expansion, let me see if I can find the plot. So this, this is the sort of latest version of this, right? Um, from the plot. And the sort of scattering is something like 300 kilometers per second or 600 kilometers per second. And that's galaxies sort of doing their dance on top of the expansion. So if you take the expansion term out, then you can see which galaxies are heading towards each other. So in clusters of galaxies, that's how you get the masses of those clusters of galaxies. So Andromeda and Milky Way are heading towards each other. So Andromeda is one of the galaxies that is blue shifted. It's heading towards us. It doesn't go through the Hubble space. Yeah. And in five billion years, they'll collide. Yeah. So, so that happens. So thanks for directing me. That was a, it's sort of a perturbation on the big picture. I was thinking. One last question. Any uh, sign of observation of any wormholes or it's still just theory? Sorry, what? Wormholes. Wormholes. 
wormholes, uh, not that I know of, but it's not my specialization. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. So, I'm James Rhodes. I'd like to begin by thanking Pilvi G and everyone else in Goa who worked to make this visit possible, and Dr. Malhotra for setting me up for uh, you know, part two of the morning's talks. Um, and I wanted to pick up where Dr. Malhotra left off and talk more about the the next NASA flagship mission that will follow after JWST, which is something called the Nancy Drake Roman Space Telescopes. But before that, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more generally also. Um, so the, the title that uh, was advertised for this was the Dawn of Space Exploration, but in a way, I think it may be more appropriate to call this talk Space Exploration of Cosmic Dawn. Um, when we talk about Cosmic Dawn, this is the that first billion years period that Dr. Malhotra was talking about from the Big Bang to the first galaxies and the first time that they had um, an impact on the universe around them. So if we're talking about exploration, exploration is enabled by new tools. And when we're exploring something in our solar system, the moon is easiest, Mars is probably next easiest. You can do that by sending a space probe there. And then you can take a reasonably normal sized camera and get it close to what you're looking at and send the data home by radio. And you get your beautiful images of solar system bodies that way for the most part. But uh, other galaxies are too far away to do that. We can put things as far away from us as we ever have and it doesn't make a difference really in how closely you can look at the nearest galaxy besides our own. In fact, it doesn't even really make a difference to the nearest star besides our own yet, though maybe someday we'll get there. So we explore those things remotely using telescopes, and sometimes we put those telescopes in space. Now, a telescope has a few basic jobs to make it possible for us to study distant objects. And when we're doing astronomy, um, one of those jobs is to gather light. We're looking at objects that are extremely distant and because they're very distant, they're very faint. And part of the progression of astronomy has been pushing fainter and fainter as time goes by. Another thing that a telescope needs to do is to make sharp images so you can study those objects, those distant galaxies in detail. And then we also want to find, you know, to study a wide field of view so that you're trying to understand the properties of the universe from a representative sample. And the last thing that uh, we ask our telescope to do is to work over a wide range of wavelengths. So Dr. Malhotra was talking about the infrared, which is emphasized in the design of JWST. And um, we'll come back to that in a minute. So I wanted to begin with just a couple of pictures of telescopes that span somewhat the range from the ground. So this is a, a picture of the Keck telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It's special to me for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that I actually sleep well, so when I get to observe this telescope, that feels like going home to me. Uh, you can see here, this is the, the mirror. It's 10 meters across. Another reason this telescope is special is that it set a new size record when it was commissioned in the mid 1990s. And at that point, it basically doubled the diameter of any optical telescope that had been built and used up till that time. And that was a, a big step forward after probably about 40 years since the, the Palomar telescope came online. Uh, that was five meters, and the next thing bigger than that was a six meter in Russia that uh, was never actually all that productive. Um, Keck telescope, another nice thing about it is that we've used it for some of the science that uh, 
we are talking about here. So um, I've been to Hawaii with uh, Professor Kilby to take data using this telescope. And uh, Dr. Malhotra has been there also and snapped that picture from inside the dome looking at the, the mirror of the telescope. <coughs> so when you make a telescope bigger, you get more light. The amount of light you collect, you can think of it as a bucket catching rain, except instead of raindrops, you have photons. The bigger the bucket is, the more rain you collect. So sometimes we refer to something as a light bucket in astronomy. Uh, it also, the bigger you make it, um, the optics allow you to make sharper images with a bigger telescope. Uh, that's because light diffracts when it bounces off the telescope aperture, and the bigger the aperture is, the less diffraction you get. So the details don't really matter, but bigger makes for sharper in principle. Now, bigger is better, or usually better. This is a telescope on uh, a mountaintop in Chile. I think I took this picture. You can see from the clouds overhead why I was walking around the mountaintop at dusk instead of getting ready to take data that night. But um, this thing has a, an aperture about that big. It's about a, a three centimeter telescope. But there's, if you remember, I said one of the telescope's jobs is to have, you know, pictures of as much sky as you can get. Well, this thing, it's 100,000 times less light gathering than the Keck telescope, but it also has something approaching 100,000 times more sky that it views at once. So depending on the job you want to do, the balance usually favors bigger, but not always. And this is something that I um, have seen on t-shirts and posters, and I grabbed it recently off uh, Wikimedia, so you can find it. Um, if you just Google, you know, telescope size comparisons. But this gives um, pictures of a few different telescopes. And I want to just highlight a couple things here. They're all to the same scale. And number six here is the five meter Palomar telescope, which was the largest in the world when it was commissioned in, I think, the 1940s. Um, maybe 50s. And these two things here are the largest refractive telescopes that were ever built and really used. So, you know, a lot of telescopes you see as an amateur or have a lens at the front and a lens at the back and you look through it and the image is formed by bending as it goes through lenses. It turns out that most professional astronomy telescopes instead use curved mirrors to make a focus. And it's basically an engineering reason. It turns out that if you build a mirror, you want your optical surface to have a very precise shape. That mirror needs to be accurate to a small fraction of the wavelength of light that you're studying. And when the wavelength of light is a millionth of a meter, um, that means you're looking for, you know, 0.1 micron accuracy in a surface that's meters across. It has to be very smooth. With a mirror, you can support that from the back and stop the glass from sagging. With a lens, you only get to support it from the edges. So that's why they stopped building telescopes bigger than about one meter using lenses at the front. Um, so the Keck telescopes that I just showed you a picture of, there's two of them. That's this pair here. You can see several other segmented mirror telescopes that are comparable in size in the world now. And shortly after Keck, building single mirrors up to about eight meters in diameter. So there's lots of those now, lots meaning about 10 or 12 worldwide that are that big. A few things here that are not yet built. This is the giant Magellan telescope, which is being planned for Chile. This is the 30 meter telescope, which will be built either in Hawaii or the Canary Islands. And this is the European extremely large telescope which is the largest thing currently under serious planning and construction with a 40 meter diameter. You can see anything bigger than these eight meter things are made of multiple pieces of glass that are put together to form a single unified surface with built in pieces just because it's hard to make one piece of glass 10 meters across. Now down here, there are some famous things we've been talking about. Number 25 is the Hubble Space Telescope. Number 26 is JWST. And Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which I'll talk about shortly, is about the same size as the Hubble. So 
why are we doing so much with things this size when we already have things this size on the ground and we're building things up to this size? Well, first I want to just mention the things in orbit. It's, it's very hard to find a rocket that would launch something any bigger than this. So that's why these big ones are all still on the ground. And we won't get very much bigger than JWST in the next 20 years, although there are plans on the drawing board, which I'll touch on at the very end, to go somewhat bigger, you know, 20 years out from now. But um, I should just, the final comparison on here, by the way, and that's a basketball court. Um, these things are getting pretty big. So why do we put telescopes in space when it's so hard to put a big one up there? And there's a few reasons. If you're working at optical wavelengths, one of them is light pollution. Um, human light is becoming a bigger and bigger issue for nighttime astronomy. Another one which is more fundamental is uh, twinkling and turbulence. So light that passes through the Earth's atmosphere doesn't come quite straight to us. Density variations within the air bend the path of the light just a little on its way down. If you've ever looked at a roadway on a hot summer afternoon, you look near the surface of the road and you see things in the distance sort of shimmering. That's because as the road heats the air and the air moves around, there's turbulence and there's density variations and that bends light on its way to you. Well, even in the best places on the earth and even straight up on a calm, clear night, you have some of that going on anyway. And that gives you this comparison between the same patch of sky seen with the Hubble Space Telescope and seen with the telescope on the ground. Uh, the sort of blockiness of this is because the ground telescope has large individual pixels in its detector, but the overall blurriness, the size of this, is set by the Earth's atmosphere. And it doesn't really matter if you make the telescope bigger once the atmosphere is determining the um, the size of your image. At that point, making the telescope bigger gets you more light, but doesn't get you sharper images. There are some ways around that, but um, I'm not going to get into that today. Suffice to say that if you want to get the sharpest images over wide fields of view, there's no substitute for getting above the Earth's atmosphere. And the last reason for going to space, which uh, Dr. Malhotra referred to briefly when she discussed Chandra, the Chandra Space Telescope, is that not all wavelengths of light get to the ground. So optical light gets to the ground. This is the um, Himalayan Chandra telescope in Hanle, I think. This is GMRT in Pune, which probes the other wavelength that reaches the ground, which is the radio wavelength regime. And there's little bits of the near infrared that get to the ground. And we've done uh, a good deal of work trying to use what you can from the ground in the near infrared. But um, if you want to study any of these other wavelengths, <laughs> ultraviolet, which is in here, longer wavelength infrared, X-ray or gamma ray, you basically need to get above the Earth's atmosphere. So with that sort of motivation for space telescopes, I'm going to change gear a little bit and talk more um, in detail about the one that uh, both I and Dr. Malhotra have been working on, on and off for the last uh, well, five years, pretty hard at Goddard Space Flight Center, and before that at Arizona State, we were involved in earlier stages of planning for this mission. So this is the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, and this is a sort of artist's conception, but I, I should emphasize this is a very accurate artist's conception. It's based on, you know, the latest CAD drawings of what the thing is going to actually look like. And why do we need this when we have the Hubble Space Telescope and JWST? Well, if you regard Hubble as the foundation, JWST is more sensitive and it covers um, a wider range of the infrared. Uh, what Space Telescope ever could? And I should mention JWST covers basically the same patch of sky as Hubble. So you get the most that's and based on one core text built to work in the optical. And astronomers have been working with cameras at optical wavelengths for many years now. They are based on silica, which is you know the detector in your camera, your cell phone camera, basically works because it interacts with silicon 
off the light interacts with silicon in a way that produces electrons you can add up and count and see how intense that light is. It, it takes a, a photon of a certain energy to interact with the silicon because basically there's no consumer market for that kind of product. But the technology has come of age now and it's possible to put together very large cameras for a certain project that work out to sort of two micron, two and a half micron wavelengths, or in the case of the ones they put on JWST, out to five microns. So Roman has a Hubble Space Telescope sized mirror, but a hundred times the Hubble field of view. And it's based on a few, you know, it's when you go to build something like this, you have to persuade someone that it's worth investing the funding. So there's really three core science cases that were put together for uh, the Roman Space Telescope. One is cosmology, which is to study um, the way the universe is expanding and more specifically something called dark energy that was discovered in the very late 1990s. It may be the cosmological concept that Albert Einstein introduced to, to see if he could find a way to have a static universe in his, uh, consistent with his theory. Um, it may be something else, but whatever it is, we see evidence that the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating now and has been for the last three or four billion years. And that requires something out there whose properties are different from ordinary matter. And we call that dark energy. And by studying in detail the way the universe has been expanding over the last few billion years, we can learn more about its nature. systems like our own are. I won't have much time to go into that today, but um, if you want to, you know, go on the web and look for Roman Space Telescope and extrasolar planets, you can find, you know, other materials there by the people who are leading those studies. Another one, which is dear to my heart, is studying cosmic dawn, and that falls within um, the more general uh, role of understanding where galaxies came from and how they evolved. But I'm particularly interested in how the earliest galaxies evolved and how they affected the universe around examples of galaxies that were have been used to study galaxies that are only half a billion years old and the universe was very much younger than it is today. When they started building JWST, they built it to study that time, to find, visit a time when galaxies were young, was the, the early sort of mantra for JWST planning. And then during the construction of it, uh, planets around other stars became a new fledgling field of astrophysics. And now it's, you know, 30 or 40 percent of what JWST is doing is studying those other planets. So we don't know what Roman Space Telescope will ultimately be used for besides these areas at the top. There will be new studies. There will be new things that we don't yet know we want to find out about. So a brief uh, moment to explain why it's called the Roman Space Telescope. It's not named for Italy. It's uh, not funded by the Vatican. It is named for Nancy Grace Roman, who was uh, a NASA scientist and NASA um, manager and planner. And she was, she's called the mother of Hubble. So that says something about her role in getting the Hubble Space Telescope built and flying. And um, she also played roles in other space missions, orbiting astrophysical observatories, International Ultraviolet Explorer. She was also a champion of women in astrophysics. I never had the pleasure of meeting her. Uh, Dr. Mahotra did a couple of times. So anyway, um, it's nice to have this mission named after someone who played such a role in broadening participation in astrophysics and in developing NASA's astrophysics portfolio. So, a few basic numbers about this. I mentioned um, the camera in your cell phone is 10 or 20 megapixels. The camera in the Roman Space Telescope will be 300 megapixels. That's a lot of data every time you snap an image. Uh, we're aiming to launch this thing in the mid 2020s. I believe 2026 is the current best guess. And uh, right now we're on schedule for that. Um, in addition to the, uh, the wide field camera, there is a, what's called a coronagraph. That's an instrument whose job is to basically block the light of a star so you can look for planets very nearby. Again, this is not my own specialty, so I won't try to speak to that. But, um, it's out there if you want to 
to look into it more. The mission is a five-year mission, and um, that's, you know, that's what's required to meet some of the cosmology objectives, but we're building it so that all of the consumables, everything that we expect might break is, is being built to last at least 10 years. So um, with any luck, we'll have 10 plus years out of this. Hubble has lasted very much longer than its initial design life. And uh, we're hopeful that JWST also may make it to 20 if nothing goes too wrong along the way. So um, the number at the bottom, the, the mass of the mirror, the important thing is not the exact number. Well, engineers care about it very much. But the thing to emphasize here is that the mirror has the same diameter as Hubble's, but it's only a quarter of the weight. That makes it easier to launch the thing into space. It's cheaper to launch with a lighter weight mirror. And that's part of the technology development that's happened in the you know, 30 years since Hubble has been under construction and launch. And a final comment, um, where will these observatories be? This is gonna be in the same place that JWST lives, which is actually 1% farther from the sun than where the earth is. So it doesn't orbit the earth, it orbits the sun. And the reason you can do that is you, there's a special place 1% farther out than we are, where you, you add the earth's gravity to the gravity of the sun and something in that place goes around the sun in one year, the same as the earth goes around the sun. Uh, it's not actually a stable orbit, so you need a little bit of fuel just to, to make sure you don't drift away from it, but it's stable enough that with a very, very affordable amount of fuel on your spacecraft, you can plan to be there for 20 years. It's an increasingly popular place to put an observatory. The wide field instrument on Roman is a, it's designed for survey style observations. It's got 18 of these times the field of Hubble's widest field instrument. In addition to uh, taking pictures in a range of filters, it also has two spectroscopic capabilities. And I'll come back to those. Uh, the coronagraph is basically a technology demonstration. It may find planets around a handful of nearby stars in a way that we cannot with anything that we have right now. It may not. The key point of it is to take the technologies that we will need for future planet hunting missions that they work in space and that we know how to build them. So for example, it's gonna be the first instrument in space that has deformable mirrors, which is to say mirrors that you actually, they're a little bit flexible and you have little push-pull things behind them that deform the shape of the mirror. And you do that in a precise way to um, take out any imperfections in the big mirror by having the small mirror adjust to fix those imperfections. And an, another aspect of this is the big data aspect. So if this little block here represents all the years of data from the Hubble Space Telescope, this is what we expect from the five-year primary mission of Roman. 30 years with Hubble, five with Roman. And that means that there are going to be new ways of doing the science. So more emphasis on machine learning, more emphasis on, you know, high powered computing, but also clever ways to do that high powered computing. And as Dr. Malhotra, I think mentioned, NASA is moving towards open data policies. All of this is going to be immediately available to anyone who wants to start working with those data. So um, it's going to be very exciting to see what people do with uh, data from the Roman archive. So how big is the wide field on this? Um, this is a, a famous patch of sky. And in here, you see the pillars of creation image, which is the famous Hubble Space Telescope image. That little square is the, the image you've seen so many times from Hubble. And this sort of funny shaped outline is the, the region that will be imaged in one shot with the Roman Space Telescope. Incidentally, the reason it's that funny shape is basically when you want to build a very wide field of view, um, the optical design they've chosen actually forms the best images in sort of a ring around the middle of the telescope's field of view. And it's not a ring because you can't afford that many of these near infrared detectors, but um, this is the part that we could afford and that they optimize the optical design to, to produce sharp images. 
Okay. Here's another comparison for how wide this is. This is how big the full moon would look in the sky from Earth. And these patches of sky shown here are basically all of the famous deep surveys that have been done with the Hubble Space Telescope for distant galaxies. So if you've seen a result on distant galaxies from Hubble, it's from almost, you know, 80% likely is from one of these patches of sky shown here. And this is what the footprint of those 18 detectors from the Roman Space Telescope looks like on the same scale. So you can see that in basically a couple of shots, you're going to cover as much sky as was done with, um, with Hubble. In Now, there are some unique features and some unique challenges to this. It's a flagship astrophysics mission, but it's also a couple of experiments, one to count um, solar systems like our own, one to study dark energy. And those aspects actually require precision that exceeds what's been done with Hubble and what was required of JWST. So part of what's going on in building Roman is a greater emphasis on um, how you'll calibrate it and how well you'll control, you know. We'd like to say that the Roman Space Telescope is like 100 Hubbles. And the way you do that, a supernova is an exploding star. And it takes the light from a supernova a week or two to rise up from just the brightness that the star was before it exploded to its maximum brightness and then a month or two to decline back down to where you're probably kind of done following it if it's a distant one. We're still studying the one that went off when I was in high school in the next galaxy over, but the distant ones kind of fade from view in a month or two. Well, if you're going to study them with the Roman telescope, what you want to do is come back to the same 10 square degrees of the sky, you know, a couple hundred, you know, 20, 50 times the area of full moon, come back to it every five days for a period of two years. And if you take all of the data from those repeated pictures of that same patch of sky and just add it all up, you get a very sensitive image, 10 square degrees of the sky. And that's something you do in six months of Roman Space Telescope time. To do it with Hubble, you would have needed 100 years. And the telescope's only been up there for 30, and it had some other jobs to do. So that's a, a general picture of the, the power of this thing. And a few of the big picture questions that we're asking in astronomy today, when did the first stars and galaxies form? How do small galaxies grow into large ones? These are being studied with JWST now and will be studied with Roman later. Um, what do planetary atmospheres look like? That's a JWST program and how stars and planets form is probably both telescopes. Uh, how common are solar systems like our own? That turns out to be a Roman space telescope uh, question more than a JWST one. And some of these questions about how and why the universe is expanding, why that expansion is accelerating, that's um, Roman Space Telescope too. So there's a couple of different ways that Roman is going to look at these um, cosmology questions. One of them is studying galaxy shapes. Uh, Dr. Malhotra mentioned how this gravitational lensing bends the shapes of distant galaxies. And it turns out you can use that to study how much mass there is between you and farther galaxies and um, study how that matter is clumped together. So this is something called uh, the galaxy shapes is something you measure and feed into a technique called weak gravitational lensing. And there's a good deal of looking at computer models and comparing to the data, but it requires the ability to measure galaxy shapes very precisely over a very large area of sky. And if you can do that, you learn from it something about how the structure formation history of the universe proceeded. And that in turn tells you something about what dark energy has been doing, because when the universe expansion gets too fast, it kind of puts a damper on further growth of structure due to gravity. Basically, the dark energy starts winning at some point, and the further formation of structure is quenched by that. 
when the expansion starts to become too fast for gravity to beat it. Um, and at that point, by the way, you know, these galaxies will keep doing what they do, but we'll stop having new galaxies forming very much as dark energy becomes more and more dominant in the future. Um, a couple of other methods for studying dark energy. One is studying uh, galaxy positions by um, mentioned where if you study the relation between the redshift of a supernova and how bright it is, you actually learn something again about the expansion history of the universe. I want to um, go a little lightly over this because I need to get to our cosmic non-science before I close, and I, I think I'm running a little long already. So um, one quick thing about the, the mapping of cosmic structure. Um, you can take an image of the sky using filters that pass any of many wavelengths of light. For Roman, those go from about half a micron to two microns, so red optical light into the infrared. But you can also put um, a prism in the way, which splits the light by wavelength. And then every object in your field of view makes a sort of a streak here. And the light at this end of the streak tells you what's going on at the blue end of that galaxy spectrum. This end is a red part of the galaxy spectrum. And we can use that to, um, to look for emission lines from galaxies, like those oxygen lines Dr. Malhotra showed, and learn from where those emission lines turn up. We learn the redshift of the galaxy. So if you take a line that in the laboratory is at 0.5 micron wavelength, and you see it at 1.5 microns, and you know that it's the same line because you see the pattern of other lines near it matches, like a finger or like a barcode, then you can learn the redshift of that galaxy from the observed wavelength of that line. So that's why we have the ability to put um, a prism into the Roman optical path. So I wanted to turn now a little bit to cosmic dawn applications of the Roman Space Telescope. So this is a slightly busy slide, I apologize, but this is a picture of the ultra deep field from Hubble Space Telescope. So this is one of our most sensitive images of the universe before JWST launched. Still ain't bad today. Um, this plot here is a version of that history of the universe with the microwave background here, the Big Bang here, and time running forward in this direction. Um, and redshift is labeled along the top. It's kind of hard to see from the back of the room, I'm sure, but um, what this is showing is that Roman Space Telescope, which used to be called W first, is going to get us out to redshifts around maybe 10. And if you study, you know, if you put a few hundred hours of telescope time into observing one patch of sky, you reach the same kind of sensitivity as this Hubble ultra deep field. But you're doing it over, you know, half a square degree of sky at a time, which is just a, a beautiful thing to have. Skip over that. Just suffice to say, the slide I just skipped says that when you do half a square degree instead of 100 times less, you get many more galaxies, 100 times more galaxies at a go. And we're going to have unprecedented samples even in the era of JWST when Roman comes up. Um, so, how am I doing on time, Julie? You're fine. Okay. So I want to spend just a couple minutes explaining how we do some of our studies of reionization then, if I have time. And I'll say what that means in a moment, but one of the things that we look for when we go to these spectra of distant galaxies is we look for a specific line of light called Lyman alpha. And what that is, is it's light emitted when hydrogen goes from the first excited energy level back to its unexcited energy state. And this line can be very strong in the spectrum of galaxies because hydrogen is still the most common element in the universe. It's the one that formed first after the Big Bang. And it's just one proton and one electron. It's the simplest element there is. And um, when, when hydrogen is ionized by ultraviolet light from stars, it makes a free electron and a free proton. 
When those two get together again, they often get together in an excited state, and then the electron relaxes back down to the unexcited state. And most of the time, it produces a photon of Lyman alpha light. So we like to look for galaxies using that light. And if that galaxy is sitting in a cloud of neutral hydrogen, if it's sitting in, a, in the universe at a time when the universe was filled with neutral hydrogen, which we believe it was from about the era of the cosmic microwave background to sometime around half a billion years later, um, those photons don't get to move freely through that gas. They follow a path kind of like this. They bounce around because every time a Lyman alpha photon bumps into a hydrogen atom, it might interact because it's got exactly the right energy to take the electron in that atom and move it up to an excited state. So what that means is when we look for galaxies using Lyman alpha light, if we see them, it tells us that the gas around them is already ionized. And if that gas is neutral, we don't expect to find those Lyman alpha emitting galaxies very easily. Now, in the, the history of the universe, after the, the microwave background was emitted, after the universe cooled down too much for protons and electrons to be free anymore, um, the universe was literally dark for a period of time until gravitational growth and structure made the first, um, the first galaxies form. And when those first galaxies formed, stars formed within them again because gravity pulls clouds of gas together and the gas clouds cool enough to shrink down to the point that they start nuclear fusion and turn into stars. Um, those first stars produce ultraviolet light and that light goes out and ionizes the hydrogen between the galaxies. This is a like a movie showing half a billion years or so of the history of the early universe from a simulation. We don't have data to show us this yet, but we do have the simulations and they're based on what we do know about structure formation in the universe. Um, the orange patches are where the gas is ionized. And what you see here is that the ionization proceeds in patches wherever galaxies form, they ionize what's around them. So towards the end of this, the, the frame is mostly filled with the ionized gas. And this whole process, turning this picture from a green square to an orange square, is what we call reionization because the gas was ionized before the microwave gas background was produced, the universe cooled down, it became neutral gas, and then galaxies formed and ionized that gas a second time, so reionization. And when you try to study this with Hubble Space Telescope, you may land in an orange patch, you may land in a green patch, and your field of view is not generally big enough to, to show the sort of mixture of those things. But the Roman Space Telescope will cover a patch of sky that's actually a little larger than the volume they simulated in this particular calculation. There are newer calculations that do bigger patches of sky. Um, so current state of the art and looking for these ionized regions is actually um, this ionized bubble that he'll be published with uh, our collaboration in 2020 is I think still the most distant ionized region that we've identified in the, uh, the universe as you go back towards reionization. I personally think there's others at higher redshift, um, but this is the furthest one that we've identified, which we did by finding um, a set of three galaxies that we could see in this Lyman alpha light so that we know the gas around them is ionized. This shows a slightly lower redshift um, structure from another survey that uh, Dr. Mohotra and I have been working on called Logger. Now, with the Roman Space Telescope, I mentioned this method of putting a, a prism in, and you see every object gives a spectrum. This is now real Hubble data. This is simulated Roman data, but this is real Hubble data from a couple of projects that Dr. Malhotra has led using the infrared camera on Hubble in this same mode, um, spectrum everything in the field. And you can see this little bright spot is a Lyman alpha line from a galaxy at a redshift of 7.5. And down here, there's another one from the same project, a very slightly lower redshift, a couple papers, one led by Tildy, one led by Rebecca Larson. And 
This demonstrates a method that we plan to do on an industrial scale with the Roman Space Telescope when it's available. And this now is looking at what we might find with Roman. So this is a, each dot in this is a galaxy in a simulation by a postdoc named Aaron Young, who we've been working with recently. And the white regions here are regions that we're pretty sure would be ionized at this stage in the simulated history of the universe. And the dark gray regions are regions that we're pretty sure would be neutral, and the, the medium gray is kind of depends on the assumptions you make about how the, the light gets out of the galaxies, the ultraviolet light. Um, and you can see here I've sketched the JWST field and a Roman field of view. So you can see again, you could fit a square this size fully in a gray region, you could fit a square this size fully in a white region, you take a rectangle like this, and it's going to cross the boundaries between the gray and the white region. So you're going to be mapping these ionized bubbles. Um, this is going back, oh, probably 300 million years earlier than the first picture. And this is going another 300 million years. These are units of redshift. I think this is, the font is too small even for me to read, but I believe the first one is a redshift of six and a half, the second one, seven and a half, the third one, eight and a half. And the, the pattern here is expected. The exact details of whether these redshifts should really be, you know, eight and a half for this picture rather than nine or eight or even nine and a half. That depends on the details of reionization history. And that's exactly what we're trying to study by using these upcoming telescopes. So before I close, I just want to say one of the great joys in working in space science is seeing a project move forward. And there's um, a colleague of ours many years ago once said, when we were working at Space Telescope Science Institute, said, you know, I, I want to work on Hubble right now because JWST is still a view graph project. That was to say it was still on the drawing boards. Well, we started working on Roman and it was very much on the drawing boards and before it was even approved but it's coming together. This is real hardware now. This is the primary mirror of the Roman Space Telescope, three images um, in the clean room up in Rochester, New York. And a new one hit uh, Twitter today. I didn't quite have time to get it into my slide deck, but they now have a picture of the whole mirror mounted in its, um, the optical assemblies coming together further than this now. And one other picture of hardware, uh, this is the, what's called the element wheel. It's each of these circles is a basically a piece of colored glass, which transmits light of a very carefully calibrated and controlled wavelength range. So you can take your color image by rotating different elements here into the optical path and building up the image in whatever colors you want out of your options that are available in this wheel. And two of the things here are actually those um, dispersive elements. Um, I'm not quite sure which ones they are today, and actually I may not yet have been delivered to uh, where the wheel is being put together at the time this picture was taken. But they're, they've been shipped from our place at Goddard to where this is being built in Colorado. And the last thing here, this is that uh, focal plane array. This is the 18 detectors, 300 megapixel near infrared camera with that shape you see that follows the region of good focus. So it's really exciting to be on a project from the, the early phases until it's um, finally coming together in hardware. So we have in space a dark sky and a bright future. We have JWST, which is revolutionizing astronomy once already with its ultra detail studies of carefully chosen areas of sky. Uh, the Roman Space Telescope, in, starting in the mid to late 2020s, is going to revolutionize astronomy a second time by surveying areas hundreds of times bigger than we can do with Hubble or Webb. And finally, I want to just mention that these missions are a very long time in the planning. I've been involved in some form of Roman since about 2005, as has Dr. Malhotra. Um, so 20 years from then until when we hope to see it launch. So that means it's time to be planning the next one. And NASA is just making a start on that. Um, 
we've had a national prioritization process called the Decadal Survey of Astronomy and Astrophysics, and that has recommended that the next thing should be um, going back towards uh, ultraviolet through near-infrared wavelengths, the ultraviolet being what Hubble can do that neither JWST nor Roman can touch, and um, also taking sort of technologies developed for web and making the going to a UV optimized or UV capable mission with a mirror comparable in size or larger than the, the JWST mirror. So stay tuned, it's gonna be exciting. Thanks. Thank you.